Hey guys, my name is Dice Rowland. Today we're going to be taking a look at a lesser known 80s movie that's been dubbed Prime Halloween Material. Hell Knight was written by Randy Feldman and was directed by Tom DeSimone. It was released, oddly enough, on August 28th, 1981. It initially received mixed reviews that leaned more on the negative side. But, as with many flops from the 80s, it has garnered a cult following in the decades since its release. Hell Knight tells the story of a handful of prospective Alpha Sigma Rho pledges, who were put up to the task of staying the night in an old mansion, where several murders took place. And, as you can suspect, they're picked off one by one, by those who were left from the previous killings that took place here. So without further ado, this is my review of Hell Knight. <laughs> The movie starts off with a song that's a little too on the nose. This is followed by a look into your average frat party of the 80s, which is hosted by the president Peter, played by Kevin Brophy, whose wandering attention has been brought to one of the new pledges, Marty, played by Linda Blair. The partying doesn't continue for too long as the pledges must be initiated, and judging by how most frat hazings go, I don't know if I want to witness that. I can only hope they're headed to Philippe Mora's house to stop him from making a huge mistake. Actually, they were headed to Garth Manor. The reason, as Jeff here, played by Peter Barton, provides, is because new pledges have to spend the night in the manor. And according to Denise, played by Suki Goodwin, the reason this is done on this particular night is because this is the anniversary when Raymond Garth murdered his wife and children before killing himself. Peter gives a more thorough background into the Garth family that had last lived here. Apparently, the Garth children weren't very fortunate in the genetics department. The elder was a mongoloid. The second born, a daughter, was terribly deformed. The third child and second daughter was mute, blind, and deaf. And the fourth and final child, Andrew, who only made noises instead of speaking. After the murder of his family and suicide of Raymond himself, the police allegedly found only three bodies, with no sign of Andrew. Naturally, it's suspected that Andrew still resides in the manor, and is most likely a touch pissed off with all the different groups of teenagers who keep spending the night in his house for free. Any questions? How do I get out of this chicken shit outfit? I have just one more question, actually. Who the fuck lit those candles? Well, it's too late to back out now as the rest of the frat leaves the four pledges for the next six hours. Denise has come prepared, though, with everything that a first pick for gruesome murder should have. Drugs, alcohol, sex appeal, and rock and roll. So she and Seth, played by Vincent Van Patten, waste no time in picking out their bedroom. So that leaves Marty and Jeff to get to know each other better. Just not in the same way that Seth and Denise are. Oh, hey, you're reaching in there with your bare hands there, boy. Yeah, he'll be fine through this shit show. Turns out Peter, May, played by Janny Newman, and Scott, played by Jimmy Sturtevant, weren't actually going to leave the four alone till dawn. They have a plot to scare the shit out of the group. While they're busy putting their plan into action, we learn that Jeff and Marty essentially come from opposite sides of the tracks, which means that Jeff's rich and Marty is a mechanic. Now it's time for the spooky antics to begin. Or as Seth puts it, Somebody's trying to mindfuck us. Oh sorry guys, that's just my haunted house atmosphere tape. I like to play it on surround sound so I feel less lonely. As it turns out, that's also what's happening here, as there are speakers wired throughout the manor. So Jeff dismantles them, which means it's time for the second part of this prank. Peter has May go around the manor to create a diversion. This isn't such a fantastic plan though, as something reaches out and touches her, and drags her into a dungeon and chops her head off. Meanwhile, Jeff and Seth investigate more tracks from the Sounds for a Spooky Night vinyl, which leaves Marty to experience something more visual. I'll give credit that at least they didn't use some cheap mask for this holographic illusion. It certainly worked on Marty. During Scott's preparation for more torment of the pledges, someone joins him on the roof and twists his neck like a bottle cap. Unaware of the doom lurking around them, Jeff, Seth, Marty, and Denise attempt to get some sleep in the mustiest looking beds I've ever seen. After attempting and failing a mirror trick on Denise, Peter goes looking for Scott. See? He just can't play pranks on someone high off their tits. On the bright side, I guess, Peter does find Scott. 
Peter doesn't get a chance to unlock the gate and escape before he too is killed by the unseen madman. Next to be meeting a grisly end is Denise in Seth's absence, and as soon as he comes back he finds a completely different woman in his bed, or at least part of her. And here I thought that's what tons of guys dreamed of, a woman giving them head. Fuck you, I think it's hilarious. So the three of them haul ass out of the manor and Seth climbs over the gate to go get help. Now, Marty can't make it over the gate, so Jeff decides to stay with her and search for Denise. Oh, what's that? Mysterious ticking coming from an old spooky house? It's probably just Mr. Poe. Actually, it's Scott and his parrot. So what do we do now? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to stand here and act out a Giorgio Armani commercial. You think that story about the Garson and the Landru is true? No, I think this is a completely unrelated event. Mr. Brooks has done horrific things, but he would never do something like this. Seeing a light out in the garden, Jeff goes to investigate, and somehow he's thrown off when the candle he brought with him is blown out on a windy night. I'll be right back, Marty. My, my candle blew out, hold on. Okay, for real this time, I'll be right back. Marty! Well, Jeff doesn't find Denise, like he thought he might, and finds Peter in his flashlight instead. Didn't think to grab those keys dangling from Peter's lifeless fingers, though. Meanwhile, Seth has made it to the police station, and tells the police about what's happening at Garth Manor. And, say it with me, kids, they don't believe him and think it's part of a prank by Alpha Sigma Rho. But Seth's not willing to admit defeat yet, as he literally steals a gun and ammo from the station. It's gonna be okay. The fuck it is! The throw rug is possessed! Though whatever that was received some perforating, it still escaped through a trap door. Jeff and Marty descend into the basement, which leads to some tunnels. While down there, they come across... the dining room of the Sawyer family. One of the remaining members of the Garth family arrives to chase Jeff and Marty around the tunnels a bit, but they do manage to escape mostly unscathed. Seth finally returns to Garth Manor in a stolen car wielding his stolen shotgun. He gets past the fence, through an opening that nobody noticed before, and manages to shoot the killer, twice. And that's great and all, but uh... While Marty attempts to grab the shotgun, Andrew attempts to grab Marty. While Marty manages to climb out to safety, Jeff does not. Well, that's unfortunate. No time to loiter, though, as Andrew is still after her. So into the garden, Marty goes, finding the keys to the gate. There's also the conveniently parked car that Seth had left behind. That stalls like a motherfucker. But that's okay, because remember, Marty is a mechanic. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that would be the perfect place to take a nap. With the sun rising and the last remaining Garth, to our knowledge, dead, Marty makes her way back to civilization. And with that, the credits roll. Alright, let's discuss this film. I do have to say that the premise for Hell Knight is pretty shallow. It doesn't do much for someone who's not just here for the horror, but the story, too. The lore is pretty interesting, and with it, it sets the proper spooky mood. But it doesn't do much more than that. It oddly feels like an urban legend within an urban legend. Legend. Obviously, we have the element of the Garth family history. And then you fold in a small group of college students who have to spend the night there and find that the legends are true. It's light on the truly horrific stuff, and kills compared to other horror movies. Depending on where you stand when it comes to the enjoyment of the kills specifically, this can be a bit of a letdown. It's a slow burn for sure, with a majority of the action and tension happening during the later half, if not the third act. There are several portions that probably could have stood to have been cut out to help the pacing. The acting isn't atrocious here, though it certainly isn't great. It's not painful to sit through, at least. And I did find myself amused by some of the dialogue and interactions. Whether they were meant to be amusing or not is debatable. Obviously, Linda Blair is the big draw for this film. Her acting here doesn't come anywhere near The Exorcist, though I'm sure that's a very unfair comparison. Though this is by no means the worst thing I've ever seen her in. This is a different role for her, and that's great. I'm happy to see her playing a final girl. The other 
other pledges are likable enough for me to not hate them at all. I think the interactions between Vincent Van Patten and Suki Goodwin have good chemistry. Perhaps not romantic chemistry as much as humorous chemistry. Peter Barton was playing the part of the good-looking pretty boy. Who wants to get and save the main girl? Unfortunately, that didn't work out so well. But again, he was pleasant to watch, even if he didn't get to portray much depth to the character. This was another case of the actors being aware enough about the movie to know that they could have some fun with it. Like I said, the atmosphere and settings, I think, are the best part of this movie. The Garth Manor genuinely looks like a place with a tragic history that will haunt whoever goes inside. And though Hell Knight's never specifically mentioned as taking place on Halloween, it still fits very nicely with the holiday. Spooky atmosphere, an abandoned place, and characters in costume. Yeah, it works well. Clearly, all the special effects are practical, and they do look decent. Nothing looks too much like a cheap mask except for the actual cheap masks. The effects for the kills were solid and got the point across, without throwing a bunch of blood and guts out there. Aside from the kills, the two Garths are the focus of the effects. Once again, they looked believable enough for me to go along with them being the antagonists whom the characters are terrified of. They each had a unique look that separated them from the other. I can't say that they stand out greatly when compared to other horror killers and monstrous creatures, but they look good. The score for Hell Knight was composed by Dan Wyman, who had also done work on Halloween and The Fog. The score is alright and it does its job for the movie. It lends itself to the atmosphere without going unnoticed, or drowning everything else out. It doesn't stand out tremendously for me personally. I believe I did detect some notes that were familiar here and there. With all that being said, I'm giving Hell Knight 5 out of 10 bloody thumbs up. If you go into this one anticipating a lot of bloody kills and freakish killers being prominently shown, you're going to be disappointed. It's a B-level horror movie that's still trying to provide some scares and good creepy fun, regardless of whether or not they came across in the way the cast and crew intended. I think it still has a good bit to offer, even if it isn't the best 80s mutant killer movie out there. If you have the patience to sit through several scenes of characters skulking about in the dark, then there's enough of a payoff for it to be worth the watch. I would recommend Hell Knight to 80s horror fans, Linda Blair fans, mutant killer fans, and anyone looking for an easy watch to add to their Halloween list. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like to let me know. Don't forget to leave a comment down below telling me what your thoughts on this movie are. And if you have any suggestions for horror movies you would like to see me review in the future, you can support the channel through my Patreon where you would get exclusive and early access to videos like this. Also, don't forget to share this video to help the channel grow and subscribe for more videos like this. See you later. If you weren't screaming, and we weren't screaming, somebody's trying to mindfuck us.